Okay, I'm getting a little wild today. Actually, this is something I've been wanting to do for a while. Um, we're going to talk about books. We're going to talk about um, reading material. You're listening to The Human Resource. And my name is Pandy Pridemore. I'm an HR consultant here in the Cincinnati market. You're watching the show from ICRC TV station. And they let me do just anything I want to do. I know some of you will be terribly surprised by that. But today I've got Courtney McKinnon with me, a uh, director of training with the HR Academy. And I told her I was going to bring some of my favorite books. And we were going to kind of talk about them because, you know, I don't think you are reading enough. You know, a couple shows ago, we talked about, you know, don't fake it till you make it. Make sure that you're getting the training you need if you're going to make HR decisions. Make sure that you're you're equipping yourself with as much knowledge as possible. And it, it kind of it's kind of scary when I'm you know reference some of these books with clients or or with um, people at different meetings and they look at me and go, "Oh, I've heard of that, but yeah, um, I can't remember the last time I read a book." Okay, I know. I'm an old shoe. We've talked about this, but no, no, no. You are going to pick out at least two of these books that we're going to talk about, and you are going to make sure that you are listen to it on Audible, right? You listen to a podcast, you listen to a book. So let's just start out with one of my absolute favorites, and and I know I've referenced it here on the show. Crucial conversations, tools for talking when stakes are high. Court, look at that. This is by far, I actually had the privilege of um, meeting one of the authors years and years and years ago. Uh, Carrie Patterson, Joseph Grenny, Ron McMillan, Al Switzler. Uh, I just, this book I recommend to management teams, even to new management members, just to teach them how to pull the emotion out of conversations. How many, really, when you're training, how many times do you find that people get so caught up in the emotion of the topic that they lose focus on what's actually supposed to be accomplished? Oh, absolutely. There, there's always a, a personal story behind everything, and, and there's always a, a way that they can tie a personal experience to, <clears throat> excuse me, the topic at hand, and so the emotion is going to drive that. So yes, you definitely need to, to step back a little bit and, and look at things objectively. This book is such an easy read. I'm telling you, and I'm not the fastest reader, but you can get through this book, at, even at my pace, in less than two days. Well, and I'll tell you, I'm actually intrigued because it says that there's a forward by Stephen Covey. Do I say that right? Yes. Covey? Covey? Yes. Um, who also wrote another book. Oh, it's um, in here. It's, it's in, in here. here. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is... And nobody one wants, of, no one wants to know that they aren't effective, but that nobody wants to know that they're not effective. However, I, you know, I think, I think the difference is highly effective with that book. That's what takes you the step oh, above. Oh, thank that, you that, so much for above. identifying that. Thank you. Uh, you don't want to be just average. You want to be stellar. There's just an effective and, and highly effective. <laughs> <laughs> the seven habits of highly effective people. One of the most uh, sold and and recognizable books. Powerful lessons in personal change. Look again. If you've got new management, if you've got new supervisors, team leads, this is another great book. Get it in their hands or get the, get the audible for them. Because again, this is a the seven habits. This is a book that people reread. That there are so many just life lessons in that book and, and that whole theory of learning and from as a from a training standpoint that's actually a very very effective training as well well let's talk about life lessons because i this is the book this is the author i should say that i'll i'll reference something in a topic especially oh, the new training team uh, training the team modules with the hr academy one of them reference simon senek on start with the why and then the book I have in front of me is find your why oh my gosh I would love to have dinner with this man I, I would love to have dinner with this man because it literally transformed um, my process in putting together programs in slowing down 
because I talk so fast and my thought process is so fast and slowing down and helping uh, them understand, okay, this is why we're sitting here. This is how we got to this point and help them understand, okay, if we now know how we got here, how do we get out? But that, that's, that's a really good read. Well, now I'm intrigued because I've actually never heard of this one. What? No, I've never heard of this one. So now I think I might take this one home with me. No, you're going to, no, we're going to, we're going to try to figure out who I gave. <laughs> start with the why with. No, I'll, bu- I'll buy you start with the why. I'll, okay, so I'll wait, so, so there, oh, the companion to start with why. Yes. So there's more than, there's yes. more than one of these. Yes, yes. So, he, he's brilliant. And he, he's, you know, if you do YouTube him, do a YouTube of him. He's, he's really, really good. Um, uh, several of my clients have used him at their annual meetings and some of the materials that they've done have been based on him and his um, his philosophies and his writings. That's a, that's a wonderful book. Okay, all right. If I had to fall in love with a book, <laughs> I know, I know. No, you know what? It's not that one. It's this one here. Why? And this this one has been in my library since it came out. Twenty. Oh gosh, twenty three years ago. And I was with working with the hospital system, one of the big hospital systems here in Cincinnati. And they brought the author, Marcus Buckingham, in to speak on this book. First, break all the rules. And the more I think about it, I think this is more applicable now in the economy and the workforce that we have now than ever. Personally, the title itself is very intriguing for me. Look how good looking he is. That's probably my favorite title. Look how good looking he is. Oh, okay. Um, he actually sat at my table uh, for dinner there at the event, and um, the, the premise with this, okay, it's, it was really cutting edge at the time, but the premise of first break all the rules is that we shouldn't try to keep taking square pegs and, ra- and shoving them in round holes. If you are really good at a particular role, if your knowledge and, and your passion to do a particular role is very prevalent... Don't take you and move you into another role and think that you can manage other people to do that. Or don't move you in, into another role and, and try to force you to be happy in something else if all along no one can do that particular role as well as you do. And the controversy really came in in that he said pay scales should be you know, altered, so just keep paying that person who's really good. If you've got a great janitor, and he's, I mean, the place is spotless, you can depend on him to just make sure everything's just pristine. Don't move him out of that role and tell him now he's going to manage the entire um, housekeeping system or the housekeeping program or the housekeeping team because he may not be a good manager. And But keep rewarding him for doing what he's doing. Keep him happy. Retention's everything. I think this is a book that has been passed by. Um, most people look at me and go, oh, I think I've heard of it, but... Marcus is phenomenal. He's also working with uh, Harvard Business Review right now. You can Google him. I would love to have dinner with him again. He would not remember me, but um, I would. But you definitely remember him. I definitely remember him. Okay. He's married. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Um, Here's one that's fun. Well, the name in itself is is probably the most fun name on the table. This is one of the oldest books I have on the table right now. It is nuts. Literally. Yes. Nuts. N-U-T-S. Nuts. And it's the story of Southwest Airlines. Now, the reason I loved this book, and I still quote things out of this book. Clearly, I mean, it's called Nuts. Well, it's because they went out of the box when nobody else would. Their whole company was founded on outward thinking and, and not staying with the conformity of what other airlines were doing or what was acceptable at the time. There's some crazy stuff in here. And then you realize, well, they, they wouldn't be where they were if they hadn't done this. Um, one of my favorite stories, and I was just talking to a group of McDonald's stores the other day about um, one of the success stories in here. He knew that he needed to cut the budget. He made the airline stewardess start cleaning the planes. You know, once the plane was emptied, the, the airline stewardess said the captains and, and um, pilots, they had to go out and start picking up all the trash out of the plane. They had to clean the plane themselves. And one of them looked down and she goes, wait a minute, why are you reprinting Southwest Airlines on the trash bag? And she took that suggestion to corporate and said, why, why are we printing our name? All I'm doing is loading this bag and it's going to the dumpster. Does the trash people, do, they, do the collectors really need to know that this is Southwest Airlines trash? 
they saved over $100,000. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars just pulling that print off the bag. And that whole concept of going to the people on the ground, I keep saying boots on the ground, know what's going on in your, your company. They're the ones who truly know where uh, efficiencies can be, where uh, improvements need to be. And this book is a wonderful example of a, just a, a highly su successful company utilizing that, that mindset years and years ago before it was even trendy. So really, really good book. Um, oh, which do I do next? Which do I do next? I hope you guys are writing these down because these are just, I'm just so passionate about these. Um, this is a book that I'm is probably more popular than uh, any of the rest of them on the table, and it's Extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Oh, my gosh, guys. This is takes your mindset back to just basic, basic communication and the need for making sure that everybody on your team understands their role. Everyone on your team is there for the right reason and respect. And, and it's not, it's not going to come out and say respect, but when you listen to what these gentlemen have experienced and what they did with their teams, you'll realize that their management style and that the lessons that they learned and what they are sharing in this book, and they, they've had another book. I'm trying to think what the name of it is, but there's a, a follow-up. Of course, I read it, um, and I've learned it out a number of times. But if you're trying to build a team, this is the book to get. Um, extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win, and let me tell you, this guy's got a voice. If you listen to it on Audible, oh gosh, he's super easy to listen to. Um, ah, here's one I reference all the time. Uh, anyone who's been working with me for a number of years knows that I hate performance evaluations. Hate them, hate them, hate them. I feel that um, most of them in today's workforce are pencil whipped. And yes, I said that. I don't think that um, they are direct enough or relevant enough to what people are doing in their positions. And this book is one of my oldest again. Um, You're not the person I hired. Now, it was written with the intent of promoting this gentleman's uh, program. It's um, Barry Douche, Brad Remillard, and Janet Boydell. But here's, here's the takeaway. And this is what I promote out of this book probably at least once or twice every month. Move away from performance evaluations and start talking about success factors. Success factors, the black and white. What does somebody have to do to stay in this position? What do they have to do to be successful in their position? This book was referred to me by a Vistage coach. And Vistage is a group of, uh, it's a program for CEOs and uh, leading uh, leadership of companies. And I have... I have read this over and over again, success factors. If you, again, want to reevaluate your performance evaluation system and program, this is a great book to reference. And um, I, I, can't, I can't refer that out enough. Let's talk about training. The Good Prophet by Charles Koch. I have referenced the training concepts and the training theories that are in this book over and over. In fact, we even made t-shirts for the plastic manufacturer um, up in Northern Ohio that I worked with for a couple years. We, we pulled a lot of programs out of this book for them because it was just, this is a, this is a very nice book if you wanna talk about how to pull teams and training. I have to, I absolutely have to promote living the five skills of tolerance if you've been watching the show, if you've been listening to the podcast, Scott Warwick is one of my favorite people. And this is a, <laughs> it's just a charming way of approaching diversity, understanding that communication is everything and that we really all do need to get along. And we can, we absolutely can. We just need to understand that acceptance is not what we need to do, but tolerance is. We cannot tell our workforce that they have to accept anything that goes against their principles or their belief system, but we can ask them 
to tolerate something. So this is a wonderful book. Again, an easy read. He is so passionate about what he does. And Scott does a wonderful job in presenting this topic. And then the last one. And you laughed when you saw this. You saw me grab this. Of course, how many copies did I have in the office? <laughs> there was at least four or five. Just <laughs> sitting on top of each other. This is uh, 2,600 Phrases for Effective Performance Reviews by uh, Paul Falcon. It, you know what, guys? It, I know that performance evaluations are hard to do, but even when you're doing a one-on-one, -on -one, and again, we're, we're not talking about a formal format. We're talking about just communicating to your employees, helping them understand this is what you're doing phenomenally, and here's the opportunity where we can maybe do better. This book actually gives you all the phrases to use in particular situations. And Paul's done a phenomenal job of even breaking down positions. If you have a program analyst, here's things to give if they exceed their expectations, here's something if they need to improve their expectations. Um, R&D engineer, research managers, uh, market research analyst, um, Let's see what else is in here. A database administrator, strategic and critical ways of thinking. I mean, this, this is just, he put a lot of work in this and it will save you hours and hours and hours of time if you have at least something. I mean, again, why re reinvent the wheel? If he's going to lay out some phrases for you and it, it, it definitely gets you thinking. It may not, if it's not the perfect way of approaching it, it will at least get you thinking about what might be appropriate. So there it is. I mean, let's be truthful, and I'm going to say this only because Courtney laughed at me, but if Bill Gates and Warren <laughs> Buffett can have their reading list, will you now have mine? Pandy can have one, too. Pandy always has one. Pandy pride more. Because you've been listening to The Human Resource. Hope you enjoyed the show, and remember, we're taking recommendations. Tell us what you want to hear, because that's why we're here. Take care.